The idea of this middle game is how to play um, against an opponent who is either greedy and trying to get material, and most certainly he is neglecting his development and forgetting to castle early. And the nice thing is that I'm not showing you examples of club players or very low rated players where you might see it a lot, or scholastic players, but rather players at, uh, at the world caliber, strong grandmasters. And I was really amazed at how sometimes they just have an off day because they certainly know the principles, but just sometimes they choose not to follow them and how they get punished. Our first game shows uh, Grandmaster Tolush, a very famous Grandmaster, playing against mm -hmm. former world champion Mikhail Botvinnik. Mikhail Botvinnik is not exactly the best guy to, do, to play footsie against with, uh, you know, with ideas like this. It never pays off. So d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5. So we have a Grinfeld. And I have to tell you, already with the next move, I was already smiling to myself because this is not a bad line. But this is such a tightrope that you really probably don't want to play it against someone like Botvinnik. And that's bishop f4. The idea of this move is that white further neglects the development of his kingside. Um, normally, either you take, take, e4, that's the main exchange. Or you play some lines with knight f3, e3, queen b3, bishop out quickly. And here, this boy basically says, I have time for all of this later. Let me develop my bishop to f4. So the bishop never stays locked in on c1. OK, in itself, not such a bad variation. But against formidable play by black, you have to be a little cautious. So bishop g7, it is very well known that taking the pawn, meaning pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, bishop takes c7, might be playable. But it, at the very least, it promises nothing. White will always get his pawn back. And again, big development advantage. It's totally playing with fire. That was well known even then. So pawn e3 castles, rook to c1. Again, you notice that white is declaring something on the queen side. He's saying, once again, I'm threatening to take on d5 and then take on c7, this time with a tempo. And the nice, the nice news for, for white is that so far his position is solid. There's nothing much to attack. But if things get open up, and they will very soon, this could be very painful. So. Black has to think of what strategy to play. You can play something like c6, but that's exactly what white wants. He wants it to be passive and cramped. Then he can complete his development, maintain a very nice edge space-wise. Or you can play very aggressively with c5. Anybody that plays a Grinfeld, this comes like the expected move. Other people might say, wait a minute, doesn't this hang the world? d5 is going to be less protected, c5 with a rook on c1, is going to be hard to regain. And the answer is no. Look at the development. White is, has a king in the center. Three pieces on the king side are, are yet to exit. But so far, it's book. It's not tragic or anything. So naturally, white takes on c5. That's a legitimate move. I don't have to tell you that if I get to take once on d4, and then let's say you play pawn takes, and I get to play knight c6, white is going to play with the isolated pawn on d4, and black has more development. And the bishop almost never belongs on, on f4 in lines like this. Because when things get clarified on d5, a knight on d5 is going to get a tempo over this bishop. So that's normal. And again, the expected response. Now the knight on c3 is pinned. OK, he played c takes d5. No problem. Again, a very legitimate move. That's one advantage of having the rook on c1. If the rook was on a1, if you can imagine the rook on a1 and the knight on f3, for example, then black could have played knight takes d5 right here and now. Because on queen takes, I could play bishop takes c3. And there'll be a rook in the corner hanging. But the rook is here defending everything. So black plays rook to d8. So we notice that. Not only was black ahead in development, but after the last two moves, he managed to put his queen on the ideal square on e5. His rook, sleepy rook on f8, went to d8. And now everything is ready for action. You see, black is definitely ahead in development. And if white is smart now, he is going to start saying, OK, let's give something back to the community so we can continue our life on, on tranquil uh, terms. Because if not, it's going to hurt. White's next move, I have to tell you, at first I watched the game by myself without commentary and without the computer, just so I can get a good idea of what, how, how well I understood the game. And I think it's a good idea to analyze games this way. 
as soon as I saw the next move, I thought to myself, there is no way that this move is good. And the computer later agreed. And it's like, I thought it was even a kind of a naive plan by White. So he played queen d2. Very, very strange decision. I could understand if he, if you would play something like, let's say, d6 and just pitch the pawn, just try to block the file, because obviously if my threat now is knight takes d5, or even rook takes d5. It's just very, with, with tempo, everything is going to become very sensitive. Or bishop c4, another logical move, develop the bishop and kind of be a bit stubborn about the pawn. Obviously, not forever, but do m more for the sake of development and interference than anything else. This move is just a, a very, very naive move. It was based on a tactic, but when you look at the position, someone at the level of a strong grandmaster definitely should have appreciated the, the coming sequence. So, of course, Botvinnik does need a second invitation for this, obviously. And now what to do? If you go knight, knight takes d5, as an example, and I go queen takes d2 check, king takes d2, rook takes d5 check, the white king just doesn't know where to find a home. What, what to do with this, with this position? It's really, I think it's really, really very miserable. If you go back to e1, I'm going to go bishop takes b2, and the white pawn structure looks like something that got punched by Mike Tyson, you know, really terrible structure. And alternatively, you can make it even worse. For example, again, I'm trying to do it without moving the pieces. Let me know if it works for you, because I think it's a good exercise. For people at home, it's definitely easy, because they can pause. So we are talking now about knight takes d5, queen takes d2 check. If king takes, must. Rook takes d5 check. King c2, let's pretend the king goes to defend his c2 pawn. Well, that's not going to work out, because bishop f5 check, king b3, rook d2, and the pawn on b2 is just indefensible, also the pawn on f2 doesn't look good, and the white king is not happy at all. We're getting all the material back with interest, with great interest. So you think to yourself, okay, even my little sister could have seen that, the guy's a grandmaster sitting with, with two hours to his clock. And I, you know, that was not very complicated. What was he thinking about? He was counting on the following tactic. Bishop c7. I was very proud that I also thought about this move because I figured there is no way he is going into something such a bad ending right off the bat. Why would he do that? Even playing a move like d6 before made more sense than queen d2. So he is banking on this continuation. Of course, the knight cannot take because the queen is going to take the rook. And this is a, a fork, so you have got to play this. And now this. So this is what white was counting on. And you know, it's a tempo over the queen. The knight is very well placed. Yeah, it's pinned to the queen, but that's, that's, uh, that goes both ways. If the queen goes too far, say queen e5, trying to fork the, queen, the knight and the pawn, then knight f6 check. And the queen is going to have a very good taste of this rook. So this is not very good. Hello. So yeah, so what to do? Where to put the queen? I also have to really worry about ideas like knight takes e7 check. So I cannot just go something like queen c6 or... So do I really have to go queen to d7? That wasn't the move that I really wanted to play, as you might imagine. Queen d7 looks like a really unpleasant blocking the bishop, coming in front of the rook that's pinning the knight. But in this position, Botvinnik assessed correctly that he is so well ahead in development and his bishops are going to be so powerful that time is more important than the element of material. The element of time is more important than material. We see it in many openings, we see it in many variations, especially in Sicilians, especially in variations where we castle on opposite sides. And here is another good example of investing just because of what you get for it. So, rook takes d5. That's not an obvious move to me at all. That was very hard to make such a decision because yeah, you can see that the black pieces are going to swarm out very quickly. They're going to come to the game quickly. But is it really enough? Kent White, White is also not that far away from Cass. In two, three moves, he's there. So of course, he has to take. And now I was very surprised to learn later that my move, and the move that was played in the game, and the move that I was thinking about, was not the best move at all. The computer really frowns on the next move. And Botvinnik played it. And of course, everybody wants bishop e6. Temp over the queen, develop the bishop. The queen has to declare where it wants to go to. 
when the queen moves back, will develop the knight, will develop the rook. It looks really, really quite juicy for black. But it's not the best. It's not the best because we'll see that after bishop e6, the queen is going to go to d3. And on d3, it does a bunch of good things. Sometimes wants to go to b5, similar to the game. And also, he wants to go to a3 in many variations. a3 is very good. It holds on to the pawn. It holds on to the c-pawn. And the queen is awkward, but in safety. It's not in danger. However, the best move would have been knight c6. That would have been a very good move. Again, first of all, putting the, the knight in a square where it's coming to b4. Then bishop e6, knight b4 combo is going to be very dangerous. And also, ideas like queen a5 check are in the offing. So OK, Botvinnik plays bishop e6. And like I've said, queen to d3 would have been the best move here. But he played queen d2. Queen d2 kind of transposed into a regular game and not as good. So knight c6. Black completely managed to solve the problem of his development. And you can guess that the next move, he's already having his virtual hand on the rook on a8 to bring it to d8 with great, great power. Now what to do? Again, tough to make a decision in this position. He is really scared of lines that involve rook d8, followed by queen a5 check. And there's going to be lots of discomfort here. Really, really difficult position. Um, there are many behind the scenes variations. You could also, you know, when you watch the video later on on YouTube, you can also see them. I don't want to spend too much time on them, but uh, I'll mention a few. It's enough to say that both the commentators and the computer, many years later, think that the best move is this move. Just put a rook in front of that a very annoying bishop. Just tempt it. Take me, take me, please take me. And of course I will. Why not? It's five against three. I will do that. And also take this thing out of ideas like queen a5 check. When you have to make a move like this in this position, when you are dying to develop this side, you already know that something in your strategy went bluey. <laughs> definitely. So definitely, I mean, but this at least gives you survival chances. Why? Because the material is starting to get reduced a little bit. Of course, I can play rook d8, but then maybe rook d3. So maybe I have to first take. But OK, after taking, and then I'd, I'd say that black's advantage is at a minimum. Maybe white can still hold. Maybe. But I'd much rather be black here than white. I can take the pawn on a2. I'm going to regain equality, and I'm going to have two proud bishops. So any ending is going to be a little more difficult to play with white than with black. However, another variation that will illustrate some of the problems is bishop d3, rook d8, of course, immediately pinning the bishop. Already I'm coming bishop f5, knight, B, knight e5. So the queen moves. Knight e5, hitting the bishop. Rook d1, again, what to do with the bishop? If you're going to go bishop, let's say bishop c2, I might play bishop c4. You know, and queen a5 check is also looming at some point. So very, very difficult. So let's say he tries to completely organize things. However, now check, king f1. I know one thing. I know who I want to be in this position. <laughs> very easy. You don't have to convince me. You don't have to twist my arm here. I mean, again, it just goes to illustrate how difficult White's position is. Just very, very embarrassing. So bishop d3 is also out. Rook c3 is the best move. He goes rook to d1. That is for sure the decisive mistake. And again, we've played only, what, just a dozen or so moves, maybe have a little more. And already White, a strong grandmaster of his time, is just being throttled like a little Mouse in a, cat's, uh, in a cat's mouth, really. Uh, already he is, they just doesn't know what to do. So rook d8. Again, this move comes basically regardless, if any, rook d8. Queen c1. Queen c2 stuff with rook b4 uh, is just going to be more <coughs> another tempo later on. So check, rook d2. That was the plan. He thought to himself, well, now life is not so bad. Yes, I'm pinned, but there's no more, there are no more rooks to come. You cannot do anything to me. You cannot, get, you cannot use your dark square bishop to pin my rook. So how bad can this be? Sure, you can get the a2 pawn back. I'll give it to you gladly, just so I can develop my knight, develop my bishop, 
and maybe even play something like King E2 and survive it. After all, I'm up material, I'm up an exchange. So, yeah, maybe he thought it's going to be good until he saw the next move. Rook D5. Fantastic. You cannot tempt Botvinnik to take the pawn on A2. This pawn is not going anywhere. There's no rush to rush, to, to rush and take it. But after Rook D5, now the relentlessness just continues. He realizes that there's not much future in attacking D2. Yeah, it's a beautiful pin, but if I cannot add pieces to nag the pin piece, I have to continue with something else. The rook comes to the fifth rank, and he is about to take on c5 and create even more confusion in the white army. What to do now? In the game, he went knight e2. Here we see what the threat was. The threat was to take, if any, let's say h3 or some move. Take, here, take, here, knight b4. And I don't know how you're stopping knight c2. Very, very unpleasant. It's just a complete crush. Okay, so he played knight e2, here, knight c3. Once again, white is trying to tempt the beast with something, with some offerings, with some sacrifices, so he will just leave him alone, reduce the material. And again, black says, okay, I have no problem with that, let's do that. It looks like this is a great defense, and maybe black will really find it hard to give such a good dragon bishop for just a knight that was back home two moves ago, and now he's not doing much. But again, when the initiative comes, why not? You gotta give stuff to, do, to get stuff. Takes, takes, takes. Already we can see that for the exchange, black got one pawn. The pawn on a2 is a goner at any time. And the queen is being harassed one more time. So he played queen b2. Again, probably the most reasonable move. And he played rook a3. I think the computer said that was something else even stronger than that. Yeah, I think the computer says, I was really laughing when I saw the move because when I analyzed the game, if you ask me, oh, okay, have you guessed what the computer suggests here? You have five guesses. I'm pretty certain I would not have gotten it. And I, I'm, I'm willing to challenge. I mean, maybe now that I said it, maybe somebody will kind of throw the move and, and suggest it. But the move is a6. He wants to play a6 with several ideas. One, the b-pawn is going to start moving forward, gaining more space and becoming more and more annoying. But more importantly, stopping the move queen b5. Because this maneuver that happened in the game forces the queen away from its best structure. After a6, it, the computer claims that there's just no good way, no good way for, the, for white to develop. Even if you play something like bishop a2, then I'm going to go rook a3. And again, I'm about to take the pawn on a2, so you can't easily castle. And it just it says decisive. OK, in the game, you played this immediately. And again, the commentators were nice enough to make those squares green to illustrate white's problems. The bishop on f1, the rook on h1, miserable pieces. So queen b5, by far the only move. There's nothing else to even look at. Here he's at least causing some, uh, he's, trying, he's really dying to trade queens. So queen c3. Queen b2, with the idea of queen c5, if queen a5, then queen b5 again. So he went here. And now he plays queen to b1. Okay, let's analyze another variation. If bishop e2, rook a2, queen b1, queen c3, pinning the rook on d2 and threatening to win it, you have to go here. And of course, our friend, the last piece to participate in the party, the knight comes. You're not castling, and I'm about to go something like knight c2 check, followed by knight e3 check. And I'm going to win the world. So, again, complete misery. So, we are here, and he played queen b1. Bishop takes a2. Such an annoying move to see, I have to tell you, very, very disappointing. He tries to take it, and then... Of course, not rook takes rook, but rather check. And now black has, white has two miserable choices. One, move his king somewhere, and then, of course, rook takes a2, winning. Or play this move, and here. So, yeah, very miserable. Bishop d3, check, here, knight e5, yeah. 
king e2. Well, the threat was knight c4. So here, check. Bishop here takes, takes. Now, normally a queen against two rooks is somewhat of a fight. But when you add an A and B pawn running down the board like they wore sneakers, that's not a fight anymore. So he played here. Yeah, F5 was another possibility. OK, here, here. A4, he could have pushed immediately. And again, the commentator makes all kinds of suggestions for other moves. But at the end of the day, we have an idea. Those two moves are just, those two pawns just run. Here, a nice teaser. If rook takes a4, queen c6 check. If you take this pawn, I go queen c6 check, forking the king and the pawn. Basically, those two pawns amount to going to cost a rook. So check here, here, here. And he played queen b5, queen c5. Again, the technique part is, is not very interesting. That's why I'm going relatively fast. At the long run, the, the rooks cannot stop such pawns. And in this position, black re white resigned. I think maybe it was adjourned or something and resigned. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be awfully hard to stop something like b3. Rook takes b2. Going to cost at least a rook. And queen and four pawns against rook and four pawns. Well, this is really not something that, to, to test Botvinnik. So the moral of this game. Again, white was very, very unambitious in the opening, more greedy than anything else. Queen d2, a very naive move. The tactic bishop c7 just completely discounted the possibility of a little investment in material, after which the, the black pieces just sprung back, guaranteeing the, the return of the investment with great interest. OK, so we are done with this game. And I'm going to show you another game of the highest caliber. Former world champion Vasily Smyslov playing one of the strongest Russian grandmasters of all time, Yafim Geller. Again, this is like as good as it gets. The game was played in 1955. They were very, very strong at the time. Just very, very, I don't think there were ratings at the time at 50, in 55, but. And again, you will see an example of black completely overpowering white, similar to the style of the game we saw before. This time, it's kind of a King's Indian. So. King's Indian. You notice that, again, it's very typical for Grinfeld and King's Indian defenses to warrant those kinds of games, because what happens? Black basically, basically tells white, OK, I allow you to build a very strong center. The cost, the charge that I'm charging you is quick development. Get my pieces out quickly, castle very early, and then the battle is, can I strike at the center and undermine it? Or are you going to maintain that pressure and get me? So. OK, the Zamish variation, one of many, many possibilities of the, king's ga of the King's Indian. Castles, bishop e3. Bishop g5 is another main line. e5, knight g2, pawn c6. Knight c6 is another move. Taking on d4 is another move. d5, takes, takes, knight e8. As you can see, the plan, as the computer reveals, is to play the move f5 trying to generate some kingside play. So far, the game goes more or less in normal, normal um, theory lines. But now Smyslov plays a plan that I have to tell you I was with my eyebrows up for the next several moves. I just didn't understand. It's not, it's not exactly recommended theory. It wasn't at the time. And I'm not exactly sure what he was thinking about. Honestly, I have no clue what he was aiming for. But again, this guy was a world champion. You know, this is not a club player. So queen d2, OK, this is still legitimate. f5. So first he goes h3. OK, why? Not exactly sure. And after knight d7, he goes g3. A very strange setup. I mean, not only does it cost time, but it also makes the whole queen kingside pawn look a little funny. You know, really, really bizarre what's going on here. So Geller was also probably thinking the same kind of way. He thought, what can he do? And he made. Knight b6, a very, very logical move. I want to go knight c4. If I'm going to go knight c4 and then at some point take your bishop, when this bishop starts getting into life via either bishop h6 at some moment or bishop f6 g5, you're going to have no counter. And without some bishop to counter it, it's going to be too much to handle. So b3, not allowing the knight to visit c4. And now f4. Typical Geller. 
once the long diagonal was weakened, and also the C3 square weakened, meaning when I'm going to use the C file, there's not going to be a pawn on B3 to just close it straight up, then this is warranting a sacrifice. It's not, it's not even a sacrifice right now, as you will notice, but even if it was a sacrifice, there's just no, nothing to really be amazed by, because everything just opens up. So, he took it, took it, and he went bishop to d4. Now, obviously you cannot take on f4 for several reasons. Like, if you take on f4, I'm always going to take on c3. Again, it's very counterintuitive, but when you win a piece, it's worth it. <laughs> so, let's say bishop takes f4, bishop takes c3, something takes on c3, queen h4 check, forking the queen and whatever poor soul is here, and I'm just going to take it. So that's going to win material. So he went bishop d4. OK, now what? Again, it's time to think of an idea. And all right, so the idea was to open up the bishop and immediately close the diagonal. How can I enjoy my new square? When I look at this square like e5, and you should also immediately think to yourself, man, that's a beautiful square. There's no d pawn that can ever kick me out. The f pawn is blocked by my own f pawn, so you can't kick me out this way. This means this is a, a practically a lifetime, a lifelong outpost. So what piece do I want to have here? If you said rook, I'm going to cry. So I'm hoping it's not a rook. So knight d7. The knight finished his job on b6. I'm not going to go to c4. I'm not going to go to a4. Let's bring it back to civilization, straight to the e5 square. h4. I think that sooner or later he can do it. I mean, uh, he could have changed the move order and played something like bishop g2, kind of crying before you hurt, but then knight e5, so just transposing, and then maybe castle long. But again, I think that sooner or later to generate some play, you'll have to push the h pawn. I don't know if it really made a difference by, between pushing it now or doing casting first. So he pushed it, knight e5, with a big threat on f3, so bishop g2. Not exactly his dream square for the bishop, but what we, when we must, we must. Bishop d7, the last undeveloped piece comes to the game, and now rook c8 is ready to, um, ready to operate. Um, I have to say that in this position, the computer was saying to also play knight f6. The idea of knight f6 is never to allow h5, maybe to play knight h5 yourself to take control of some squares. But I was thinking to myself, knight f6, what if I just take on e5? Killing the good knight, allowing us, giving myself a protected pass pawn, that in itself is not really something that's moving soon. But then I'm also killing the diagonal of the bishop, but the computer claims it's okay. As a human, I can't bring myself to make this move. Really, sorry. It just, to me, it's like, I, I, I love my bishop, I love my knight. There's, I'm in no rush to go knight f6. I'm not really afraid of h5, because I can always play g5. And then g4 becomes a serious move on the agenda. So, but computer said, you know, when the computer says, the computer knows. But you know, it'd be, you can play rook f7 and bishop f8 then. And then the bishop will change diagonals. The bishop will change diagonals, and white has no answer. I you know what, I agree. I, I can disagree. I think that already white's strategy of playing h3, g3, and putting a bishop on g2, it's, that's not what that's not what the doctor or not what the doctor orders. Smyslov or not Smyslov, sorry. So, but okay, this is of course also an acceptable plan. And he played bishop f2. Yeah, this was again not the most recommended move, bishop f2. I think that the computer suggested something like casting long, putting the king in safety somehow. But again, black is just better. I don't have to tell you that knight takes f4 is going to be answered, but rook takes f4, queen takes f4, knight d3 check. So the pawn on f4 is just for decoration. It's not for using. So he played bishop f2, rook c8, an easy move to make. Lots of control on the diagonal. And he played knight d4. Again, it's very understandable that he wants to block that bishop on g7. He must have something stay on d4. Probably the bishop would have been the best. I don't think that the knight move is really helping. Because as you will notice, black just gets more and more free moves. The initiative just swarms. So anyways, knight d4, queen a5. Again, sometimes by process of elimination, you can tell. I mean, the knight is as good as it gets. The bishop can't improve his position. 
I can play knight f6, but I'm in no rush. You have to think that at some point, maybe white wants to play knight e6 to completely discombobulate uh, the black position. If he could somehow miraculously move his rook, go knight e6, and after the capture, go knight d5, after the pawn moves here, maybe he's going to generate some counterplay of his own. So black is giving him no rest. Queen a5, immediately on the knight on c3. Rook c1, an understandable move. And black plays. Again, let's think of what he should play. Again, process of elimination. My rook is, again, as good as it gets. I can't really improve this bishop. Same to be said about those pieces. So this knight, right? Basically, you can tell the knight on e8 is my least favorite piece. So I have to choose a direction for it. Should I go this way? Or in the game, look what he did, just marvelous. When you think that this knight in two seconds is going to play a, a, a really important part of the game, you think, wow, really? Is there time for it? Answer is yes. Knight c7. Already you can see the arrows of the suggestion of the route. There's even an improvement. In a second you will see, because again, it just exists. So he played rook c2, the computer's first choice. Knight a6. Castles. On move 22, finally he managed to castle. But if he thought that he's going to get relief, the answer is no. So what would you play here? Again, I was really surprised that, first of all, I didn't see the move myself. But I, I have to tell you that at this part, I was so disillusioned about white setup with the bishop on f2, bishop g2, castling into this funny setup. It's obvious to me that black is just very happy. So I wasn't, really, I wasn't really trying to guess moves, but I was surprised to see that the computer suggested it. In the game, he went knight c5. OK, who can complain, right? That's just a fantastic move. But it's funny that the computer suggests knight d3. Just a beautiful little tactic. It's like really in your face kind of move. Knight d3, of course, I want to eliminate the bishop as one thing. I also threaten to play knight b4. And where is this rook going? And of course, if you wanted to know what happened if I take the knight that looks like a freebie, I'm going to go knight b4, forking the queen and the rook. When the queen moves and it has to move, I'll take the rook, and then this knight on c3 is also hanging. Everybody understands? Should I, should I make the moves? Or you understand? You understand, right? Knight d3. If you don't take, my knight is just going to create havoc, and the other one is coming to b4. And if you take, I go knight b4, fork the queen and the rook, take it, take it, and knight c3. So knight d3, very, very strong. But he played here. Also, who can complain about this move? Really excellent. Now what to do is white. Again, it's, I wouldn't say it's a Zugzwang position, but it's really hard to recommend the move. Normally, you would want to play a natural move like rook to c1 and fight for the file. But I'm immediately putting a knight on d3, attacking everything, and at the minimum, taking the bishop. That's totally not helping. So he tries to reduce the material by offering a queen trade and going knight c2. You know, again, expecting the queen to go back somewhere. But black says, you want to trade queens? I'm ready for it. I'm totally in for it. Why? Because after the queen trade, I have a very simple tactic that guarantees me an ending with a very active rook, two strong bishops. Let's take a look. Takes, takes, bam. Knight takes e4. You have to take f3, immediately regaining my invested material. Now I'm all over the pieces. Now really, this is becoming not so funny, right? I'm all really attacking everything. So he tries to take, take, forking everything, takes and takes. The storm is over. I now have two bishops. I, the white pawns are extremely weak. And in case you didn't notice, I also got my material back in the process. So. Life is really, really not that fun for white. Very hard to defend. If you put it in the computer, the computer is going to say, yeah, maybe black is like up one point, but I can still defend it. In other words, you'll have to be super accurate for 20 some moves to, to not lose it. But for a human, especially someone at the level of Smyslov, realizing how yucky his position is, it's very hard uh, to, to, to defend a position like this. So bishop takes a7, that's reasonable. Rook h3, yeah, everything is going to come back. Bishop f2, bishop e5. OK, again, a very good move. But the computer claims that bishop h6 was pretty much winning immediately. Bishop h6, rook goes to b2. 
where else? Bishop g4, miserable position, like really, really bad position. Or like two bishops with two rooks all active, all around. I can always get my pawn back. I mean, those pawns are just falling like flies. So, but okay, this is not exactly spoiling anything. Bishop e5, knight d4, okay, bishop g4. Again, look at the activity. I'm basically guaranteeing that you cannot move, well, anything. If you move the knight, I go bishop f3, and you're going to get mated. If you move this bishop, where are you going to move this bishop? Here I take it, here I take it. So bishop e1, practically the only move to, to make here. And he did. Rook e3, now that the bishop moved, I'm starting to pick on the pawns. Bishop back, rook takes e4. Rook e1, takes, takes, rook c1. And that was all she wrote, because now he is just losing. I think he resigned here, yeah. Simply because, well, what are you going to play? If you play the move king f1, for example, I'm going to go here, knight c2, I guess, to defend the bishop, and then I'm just going to take this guy. Now make a move, good luck. You know, it's like the rook is defending the knight, the knight is defending the bishop, the bishop is pinned. The king isn't really going too far because he has to defend, defend the bishop. And I have those two marchers, I'm going to go h5, bishop g3, h4, h3, and have a really good time. Alternatively, um, after this, maybe king f2 is another move, another try. But after, can I go here? After this move, white has really lost the eagerness of continuing. Very, very displeasing. A beautiful show by, uh, by Geller. Really very aggressive game. I mean, that's the kind of game if I played it, I, I would go home really feeling like I got all my aggressions out for the day <laughs> or for the week. Okay, so we are done with this one. And I suppose we do have time. Yeah, sure, why not? Now we'll see another masterpiece. This time, Paul Karras, who was, they just celebrated, I think, 100 years to his birth, I'm assuming birth, in uh, Estonia. He was really one of the best players in the world. I, one of my friends wrote some article recently, and he called him the eternal number two player. Because I think five times he missed a chance to qualify for the finals of the, of the world championship. His opponent is Mark Taimanov, again, a strong Russian grandmaster, a former candidate very famous for losing to Fisher 6-0 in their um, round of eight, I think, match in the 70s before he played uh, eventually Spassky for the title. So watch this game. d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e4. This line was very, very, um, in, very much in fashion at the time. It was even more in fashion some years later when Kasparov used to play it, maybe some like 30 years later. Knight f3, b6, bishop g5. It's kind of a combination, the Queen's Indian, Nimzo Indian type of structure. And again, a variation where white is getting a lot of space, getting the center, but black is getting very quick development. So e3, h6, bishop h4, g5. All this is very well known here. Knight e4. I am thinking, if I'm not completely crazy, that knight d2 is one of the main moves here. Even though it gives up a pawn here, it's kind of, again, nothing to be afraid of to give such a pawn. Uh, but of course, queen c2 is also a normal line. Bishop takes c3. I think f5 also is a possibility, or d6 and f5. So takes, but again, it's not the opening we're discussing so much as the middle game. So pawn takes. Pawn to d6, controlling the e5 square. Here, f5. OK, so we have reached the, the position from which I wanted to start. And again, in this position, you have to think to yourself, well, what to do? The deal was made. I have two bishops if I'm white, but I have a very annoying weakness. I have double pawns and a very poor structure, broken structure. From black, I'm happy about the structure. I'm really missing a dark square bishop. If somehow I could bring a dark square bishop into the game, I'd be really happy. Like if I could trade my knight here, that does nothing for it. So, excuse me, if you're white, you have to think to yourself, okay, how do I activate my pieces? Right now, 
my knight is not going forward anywhere, my bishop is not going forward anywhere, this bishop is being stopped by a knight, so it's like black is having a lot of control in the, in the center right now, and how do I get activity? One move that you might consider is to play a move like knight d2, but after knight takes d2, I might be able to take this pawn. So you might be thinking, okay, let's castle first, then of course I have, I'm just in time to play like knight d7, knight f6, and complete my development. So it, after some thinking, Karis, who was never someone to shy away from a real battle, comes up with d5. Very, very good. This motif happens a lot in this variation, really a lot. And you really have to know what to do in a position like this. And here, I think it was a little bit naive of Taimanov to play, but maybe you have to remember again that this game was played in 1955. The evolution of this variation is basically in his, in his diapers. This is just the start of really discussing this line, not really, uh, we're not talking about 30 years later where everything was well known and played automatically 30 moves. So what he does, I think, is not the best. So he takes it. Alternatively, um, I'm trying to remember what was the alternative. There was some idea where you just give up this pawn. But I don't remember how it goes. Maybe queen f6 first, something like this. Yeah, maybe queen f6 would have been a much better move here. Yeah. But he goes for it because, again, at first glance, you gave me a pawn and why should I not take it? What's wrong with it? So the pawn was sacrificed. The idea was, again, to create lots of counterplay, lots of open lines, and watch what happens. OK, step one, knight d4. No rush to castle. You could castle also. It's not a big deal. But first of all, I'm already, thanks to the removal of the pawn on e6, the pawn on f5 becomes really, really weak. Not only is it weak, but it's also supporting the knight on e4. So if I get it, if I take this pawn, if I sack even for this pawn and then I regain it by taking on e4, I'm going to win my piece back in an instantly and, I'm, and I've gained the pawn, my sacrifice pawn. What's more, thanks to the structure of h6 and g5, the black king side is irreversibly weakened. And it's going to take awful long time to try to castle this way. So in this position already, white's compensation completely overtakes the, the pawn. So he plays knight d7, and white kind of transposed. Queen f6 also would have led to uh, uh, f3. And after knight takes g3, h takes g3. And again, the pawn on f5 has no good way of being defended. So knight d7. You could, excuse me. Kill it. So, of course, you can take the pawn on f5 immediately. There's nothing wrong with it. But f3, knowing that the pawn on f5 is not going anywhere, knight takes g3, pawn takes g3. Again, you can see that white is completely ready. Black really wishes that there was a game where he could put his pawns backwards. If he could play f f7 and then g7, yeah, he'll be all right. So queen f6. Bishop takes f5, castles. All right, this was black's only plan. We can agree, right? There was nothing else but try to bring the king to safety. No way I can leave it in the center. And there's no way I'm casting the other way with this rook on the h file and probably a chance to double. And again, white has many possibilities here. Uh, for example, a4 is one mentioned move, but he plays queen a4, very, very nice. It's beautiful when you play a move like this. Not only are you tickling the pawn on a7, and boy, will I take it if you give it to me, but he says, forget about king b7, forget about king b8, because this guy needs some extra help. He's attacked twice, you cannot move it. So it's either lose it or make another weakness in the position, which he is forced to make. OK, now, again, a lot of ways to gain tempi, but he plays very, very quietly. He could play e4, c4, all those moves, but king f2. Not only putting the king in safety, but the other rook is coming into the game as well. h5. What else to generate some counterplay if not h5 and h4? OK, again, e4 was recommended by one of the commentators. Again, a very good move. But he played rook to b1. 
h4. And again, in this position, I can either take on h4, I can play g4, or I can play what was played in the game, which was e4, oh, e4 was played, sorry. I mean, gh4 or g4, yeah, and e4 was played. All of them are equally good. Here, if you take on g3, king takes g3. You might say, whoa, the king is on g3, but the computer is not impressed, and neither was Keras. So bishop b7. Again, g4 is another move to consider. Takes, takes, and knight e6. OK, now, the best move would have been to play queen takes c3, after which queen d1 is the recommended move. And rook c1 is already coming with no checks or surprises. And white is really, really hurting. And of course, the threat now is knight takes c7, as you will see. So he did knight e5, but that was, that was definitely a question mark. Well, the black position is just very difficult, very hard. I mean, if rook e8, then of course knight takes c7. Notice that the knight on d7 is just not very well protected. So black position is just unenviable. So it breeds mistakes, as we said here. Of course, he could have played knight takes d8 check, king takes d8, queen d4. But no rush, queen d4 immediately. Very, very difficult position. Already you can see that there's a very poor chain of pawns. And now I'm interested in playing check, king takes, queen takes b6 check, and queen takes b7 mate. So he went rook here, knight takes c7. There was really no way to do anything in this position. Position is just, just miserable. So here, takes king b8, queen takes b6, knight d3 check. OK, king f1. This is just in, in lieu of resigning. And at first, I thought that knight c5 saves the day. Maybe that was his idea. I'm guessing maybe he thought that after knight c5, he gets lots of counterplay, but knight a6 check just wins. Because you cannot take with the knight, because it's mate. And otherwise, if you move the king, I'm just going to take on c5. And everything is hanging. You can't even take back as it's mate, and not to mention the queen. So knight b4. And again, maybe some tricks. Maybe there's a chance to play something like queen takes c3. You know, maybe if the queen moves, bishop a6 check. But he just does takes, takes, knight b5. You know things are bad when the computer suggests queen takes f5 in this position. <laughs> then it's a, it's a pretty good sign, pretty, pretty good sign that things are not, not going well. Of course, queen a7 check, mate, very hard to stop. So resigns. Again, in all three games, I hope that you have seen um, the, the, the common theme. In an opening, when one side allows the opponent to build a strong center and or get get some little amount of material. The compensation comes in, in, in form of quick development, very strong activity. And of course, oftentimes, as you will see, it requires further investments, either of an exchange or a piece or a pawn. Almost always, it's a good idea because you get very quick piece play. When you play, it in, when you play this, I always recommend it because again, maybe now the, the main measuring, t the measuring stick is playing against stockfish basically, or, or, or Komodo, or one of those computers. And they will take the material, and sometimes they'll be able to defend. Sometimes later on into the variation, they admit, too, that there's a lot of compensation and that it's very difficult. And if they can make a draw, that'll be an achievement. But remember, when you play humans, that's almost always the recommended way to go. I tell my students always, play those gambits, play those aggressive openings where you have a chance to sacrifice, even if the sacrifice is saying equal, or that doesn't mean a draw. Just yesterday, I had a lesson with one of my students that I'm showing her a variation. And in the variation, it tells me, yeah, but the computer says that even after this sacrifice, and even after this sacrifice, if black plays accurately, it says that it's like only 0.1 for white. And it says equal. I told her, yeah, it's equal, but it's not a draw. And go figure. You think that your 2,000 opponent is really going to find it, or an 1,800 is really going to find all those defenses? And even if he does, it's still a game. And he still has further hurdles. And if worse comes to worse, OK, so he made a draw. Congratulations. Chess is not white to move and win. So 
Anyways, that was the lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be here again next week.